Hi, I'm Hess playing with M Lifestyle, and today I'm interviewing Drew. And Drew is a professional mentor. Drew, um, I read a lot about you. One thing I found out was you were actually a finance major from Virginia Tech, and you quit your job two times to do this. I know that one thing that you want to do is help people find out who they really are. How did you find out who you really are? The way you find out who you are is you just continue to live life, continue to find things that you like and things that you don't like. You have to ask yourself difficult questions. I think a lot of people are afraid to ask the difficult questions. And if you spend the time to do that, I think that's that's how you find out who you are. You also find out who you are off of reflecting off of other people. The one thing I've heard that you said is that it's not about the question, it's about how we look at the questions. What advice do you have for people like that who have questions but don't really know how to approach them? That's the role of a mentor. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have a problem, what a lot of people do is they, they just start addressing what they think the problem is, but oftentimes it's a symptom of the problem. It takes about seven different times to actually ask what's wrong or what's the problem until you get to the real problem. Some people can do that on their own pretty well. Um, I think writing, journaling helps with that, but to have a mentor or somebody else who's taking the time to get to know you and invest in you and then pose difficult questions back to you, they also might have some insight that you wouldn't have necessarily on your own. One thing that I will make sure of unique individuals is the fact that you were willing to take a risk. And the risk could have not had any outcome. It could have been a failure, it could have also been a success. <laughs> when you quit your job, you tell me about how you really had to reassure yourself every time that this was the right thing for you. Did you have people that were there for you that were also reassuring? Well, in quitting my job, I did that twice. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, takes, it might take a couple times. There was a lot of second guessing. I mean, at, not the whole time, but both times um, at certain points. And I did have people, I mean, you have to have people that support you in, in any endeavor. I guess you, people could go entirely by their own, but that's, um, that's difficult. But I mean, it, it certainly felt like I was on my own many times because even if there are people around you supporting you, it's still not their life, it's yeah. your life. Yeah. And so you are responsible for your own decisions like mm -hmm. nobody else is. Yeah. That's actually one thing I learned early on and that I also try to, to teach people is that you can take advice from people, but you're still responsible for the results, whatever they may be, whether they're good or bad. And part of um, like growing up and becoming an adult is actually realizing that, that if you make poor decisions, you're gonna re reap the, the consequences of those. But if you make good decisions, you also, again, get the benefit of that. Tell me more about your book, That's When You Speak Down. Tell me about when you make decisions to write it and the process that you have to go through to finally say, I really want to write this book. Yes. I'd say probably like when I was in my early 20s, I was just like going about you know work and, and as a financial advisor, and I was dating this girl at the time, and she calls me up from out of town, and she's like, I'm getting the beat down for life. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point I put the prefix 20s on it mm -hmm. because what we realized was that a lot of our friends were just sort of it's having this, thing. yeah, they were like having the, they didn't, they didn't really talk about it, but they were having like this, you know, sort of glassy expression on their face and they're like, like they're going through the beat down too. Like, they're going through the beat down. Mm -hmm. And so this was at a time when the economy was really good. Most people had jobs, so they didn't really talk about it too much, but there was still like this sense that they weren't entirely happy with like where they were in life. Either something like a relationship was out of place or financially something wasn't, it just wasn't what, what, where they expected. One day she lifts her glass up to me at, at uh, dinner and she says like to the book. I was like, what book? She's like, the 20s beat down. Like you're gonna write it, I'm gonna edit it. And I was like, I can't write a book. Like I have a financial career to, to um, maintain. And um, I don't know, I mean, it just so happened that it, I started writing it and I started interviewing people to see if this like, phenomenon was really true. And um, I ended up quitting my whole job and to write this book. And I was gonna have this coaching and consulting company and I thought it was gonna be great. And uh, I just really realized after quitting my job, then she even dumped me, that I was like, wow. I am just a unemployed 20 something. Like who am I to tell my generation anything about mm -hmm like what to do with their lives because like I'm clearly a failure now. <laughs> Though I wrote the book, I was writing it for like several months there, I completely um, 
lost motivation? Yeah, I just like lost my motivation on it and I thought it was a bad idea. But then I matriculated into grad school and the academic world did not like this idea at all. They just really seemed to put the, the final nail in the coffin. So I just like abandoned the project altogether. So fast forward like seven years or about, and um, I started to have these people that I used to mentor chase me down kind of, <laughs> like, where the heck is your book? Like, you know, I was like living in Manhattan, I was like getting the beat down. And um, so I was like, well, crap, I guess I have to write it now. And so it was just, it was really funny. I mean, I had a lot of people that would just sort of, things sort of like haunted me and chased me back down. So that was 10 years ago that I initially started to write this book. Yeah. And so in about the last like year and a half, I've actually been working on it. It's interesting how it was those people that you helped that were the ones that were on you, like Drew was the book, because at the same time, they know what the impact that you've had on their lives. So they also want you to have that impact on other people as well. So once again, it is important to help others because sometimes when you don't see the motivation in yourself, when you don't have it in yourself, they can see that in you and motivate you. That's really important. So we've been talking about your book, we've been talking about the career future and a lot of things, but I'm pretty sure what our audience wants to know is what is your definition of 20s beatdown? The 20s beatdown is just the time period of life when you're in your 20s and you just might feel beat down by life, either from some type of difficulty that you had, like either like finances or relationally, uh, but a lot of people feel stuck or they just feel crushed in spirit. And sometimes people are like on their path and they're like, this is the path that I'm going, like my career and field, but then they start second guessing it. Yeah. Or they might wonder why they're not getting ahead more. They don't, they don't know, they know what they want to do, but they don't know how to get there. But then other people are either unemployed or underemployed or just like miserable. And they're like, they're trying to figure out at the get go, like, what am I doing with my life? And trying to figure it out, figure out their purpose. Who am I? Mm -hmm. So the 20s beatdown comes in a lot of different formats, but it just it, it, it's a name that fits because people just feel like they're beat down from life. I think that it's not just an individual thing. People are thinking, they ask me, they're like, well, how can, I, how can I get out of this? How can I be successful? How can I you know, find happiness? But I think all those are the, fundamentally the wrong question because I think part of what the beatdown is is that it's taking things that we've been indoctrinated with in society, like everything our parents have told us to do, like, oh, just go find your dreams, do what you want to do, you can do anything that you want to do, and it's really very self-centered. And it's so long as you're just on this quest for happiness, those people actually end up being less happy, ironically. Mm -hmm. But if you're more looking at life from a collective standpoint, like, how can I, um, you know, we have neighbors, how can I make my neighbor's life better? Or how can I make the people who live after me, the next generation, how can I make their life better? Those are better questions. The reason that we're in the 20s beatdown, I think, is because we have entered into a world, I mean, it's like, when you're in your 20s, it's the first time that you're dispatched out into the adult world, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like one of my mentees said, it's like you're like riding down one of those water flume slides and it's like, you know, guiding you the whole way, and then all of a sudden you just hit the water. Okay, yeah. But it's like, were you ready? Well, you've entered into a world that you didn't create. Like, all the prior generations have created it. Mm -hmm. And like, what do you have now? You have like 17 trillion debt that we owe, you know, like that's on our shoulders. And a lot of people have personal education debt. That's a trillion alone right there. So it's like, thanks a lot, mom and dad and elder generation. I'm not bringing up that point to put blame on them, but it's like, do we want to do that for the generation after us? And so you got to think, well, what was mom doing? Well, mom was just playing on her iPhone the whole time. She didn't really give a crap about anything. She was just trying to, you know, do what felt good at the time and didn't really prepare the next generation. And so my question to you would be, what would you want the generation after you to say about you? You know, would, would you want them to say, Mom and dad really, um, you know, did something that provided for me and like left me a good society or did they leave something that was not quite as good? I think that's what a lot of the 20s beatdown is. It's sort of like the, the dismantling of um, values that we've been indoctrinated with that really don't work. These days it's a lot of me, 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 I'm going to succeed, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to do this for myself. 
and we forget about the people around us. Yeah. We forget mm -hmm. about the fact that everything that somebody else does, even though it might not affect you directly, it will affect you in some way, somehow. So it, imp it is important for us to be, in a way, altruistic and to think about other people and also think about ourselves. Find a balance between that. I'm not saying be self-centered. Don't be too involved in caring about other people that you forget about yourself. But you have to find a balance because it, impor it is important to leave something good for the next generation because the next generation is the future and you would not want your future to be full of people who really did not know what they want to do mm -hmm. or to be full of people who are unhappy because they did something that mom and dad told them to do and not something that they really were passionate about. The 20s beatdown is sort of like the rub between the individual mm -hmm. and society and and they just don't, they don't interact. For instance, like when I was in my finance career, they would just say, fake it till you make it, just work really hard. And, and I was really motivated by that. I mean, I thought that um, it was a sales career and you know, that my dreams would come through making a lot of money, being really focused, you know, reading all the business guru books. Um, but in reality, like my mom and dad would call me like, are you coming home for this time or that time? They live out of town. Uh, I would say no, because I was like, I had to put my career first. But see, that's the whole thing. The irony of it is like by putting your career first, thinking that's actually good for your family, it's not. Yeah. Those are the exact things that have led to a lot of family discord where like mom or dad is just working, working, working for the sake of the family, but then they ended up spending like zero time with their kids. And so who is the product of that? Like, today's 20 something. <laughs> so it's like you have to make decisions and say like, no, some of these things were wrong. And that's why it's difficult. So that's part of what the beatdown was for me. It was like some of these um, false ideas sort of had to be beat out of me because I was embodying them. And so that's a lot of my message is, um, you know, in preparing the future, really like, think about what's important to you, who's important to you. The most critical things that we have as humans are time, relationships with other people, money or property, but you also have your natural gifts, talents, and abilities, your physical body, and you, know, you only have so much energy. So if you think about it, those are the only things that you have that you can um, steward or control, make decisions with. And so think about how you're investing your time or wasting it. How are you treating your relationships? So if, if time is one of the most important things, commodities that humans have, which I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets any more, any less. Yeah. It doesn't observe race, color, creed, or anything. Money comes and goes, but time, only everybody, everybody has the same amount of time today. So how are you using that time with what's most important? If relationships are most important, you have to put time and relationships together. But you also have, you know, if taking care of your body is important, and you have to like sleep a certain amount of time, eat right. So it's really about steward in your resources and um, understanding for the future what is going to get me the best you know payoffs and uh, um, results in the future and I don't think a lot of people think that way mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people just think like so immediate and short term and that's part of the reason that they get beat down because it implodes the question is what's the first step if you're going through the 20s beat down what's yeah. the first step in, yeah. in dealing with that. Yeah. I'd say the first step is actually not to try to get out of it. Hmm. Well, That's what everybody wants to do because it's just on a quick fix. Most people think that they would want to get out of it, but that's the wrong question. That's the worst thing to do. I think the best thing to do is actually own the beat down and realize that you're in it. Um, so much of the problem is you're always looking for the next step or the next fix. So by observing that you may be in a beat down or say in a bit of wilderness, engage in the conflict, because in the conflict is where the results will come. In the conflict, you learn who you are. In the conflict, you learn what's important to you and what's not important to you. In the conflict, you learn what your strengths are, but you also learn what your weaknesses are. So the first step is to engage in the process, and it's what I call own the beatdown. Nobody learns in smooth sailing. Yes. I mean, ask any successful person, and they will tell you that they've learned and they've like come into who they are in the struggle, in the conflict. Yes. Anybody who's been really successful has had tremendous, usually setback and failure, in fact. What personal conflicts did you yourself experience? 
Well, I guess beatdown 1.0 would have been <laughs> uh, would have been the initial time where um, you know I was I was trying to engage in a world that that I didn't feel like fit me. I mean, it was a it was a high end or a high speed, high paced sales job, mm -hmm. and it was like fake it till you make it. And I was doing everything that I thought that I was supposed to do, but it just like had this rub with my spirit like for a long time. But I would ignore it because I thought that you know, I was following all these people that were very successful. Like they had nice houses, they had nice cars, they had a successful family seemingly. Um, so the first conflict I think was to realize that not all that was like cracked up to what it was, you know, really looked like it was to be. Mm -hmm. So that was the first conflict. And at first I sort of like went into that world I, I took the conflict but sort of like sold out to it, you know, and I like put in the activity, I put in all the hard work, but it just, for me, it wasn't sustainable. I would get off like that rat wheel, you know, I think a lot of people feel that, particularly in a sales job, they're just like, they're like, just on this rat wheel the whole time, or a lot of other jobs. So that was probably the first conflict. I think then, after that, it was, I made the decision to like make a different route and to pursue writing this book, for instance, to pursue helping other people. But it's like, well, how do you make money doing that? You know, like, how do you make a living? It's like, it, that didn't seem sustainable. So that conflict after I made that decision was, how do you, how do you stick to it? How do you not give up? How do you um, continue on that path when it doesn't seem like you have immediate results? So that was a big conflict. Okay, how were you able to deal with the conflict of your own personal beatdown. I did a lot of writing, a lot of journaling, and to me, engaging in the conflict wasn't just like talking to people about it, which I did do, but um, to really like sit, like ask myself the really tough questions and then sit with them and then write about it and process it. And another really effective way that I recommend to a lot of people is also just unplugging from everything like get out of your normal routine and get away like turn off the TV to get away from your iPhone and and sit and really um, think about what's important and who's important to you I mean that's really how I got through most of the conflict and then I adjusted my behaviors you'd asked me before about people that had motivated me during times that I was down well there was this one individual when he got into his 20s he had told me that um, he probably would have been like on drugs or dead had I not, you know, been his mentor at that time. He's like, if I hadn't met you, I probably would be dead. That's what he said. And it really gave me motivation that I was doing the right thing. But what was important for him in like dealing with his conflict was to understand that he was part of something greater. He didn't feel like a lot of purpose early on, mm -hmm. but by helping him to figure out what was important to him and who was important to him, was able to give him the motivation and also, um, I guess, the reason to you know, not kill himself or, or a reason not to just get totally strung out on drugs. Yeah. When I mentor people, I'm constantly asking questions about helping them to find out what's really important to them and what's not gonna change. And everybody wants to be part of something bigger. And I recommend to people that they develop a vision or they have a vision that will keep them uh, motivated. And if you don't have your own vision, because some people don't, that's okay. But get connected to somebody else's vision. Martin Luther King had a wonderful vision that was big enough for a multitude of people. And so if you don't have your own, it's fine. Attach yourself to something bigger, at least in the meantime, that you can really be part of. And that gives people purpose, that gives people reason to live, but also reason to keep going and live, like, say, through the beatdown. This whole thing is, is a positive message. It's a message about um, understanding not just what fulfills you, it's nice. And I think if you do live out your dreams and you do live out, you know, utilize your gifts and employ your gifts for other people, you will be fulfilled, but that's not the end reason. And reason is always to help your neighbor, is to help the people that don't even live on this planet yet. Wow, it's really inspiring. One thing I really, really do love about your story is the fact that you're a risk taker, you took initiative, you know? <laughs>
you took a okay. risk with not nobody ever knows what the outcome will be when they take a risk. And that is one thing that we see a lot with people that we feature in lifestyle. There are people who do usually do what most people don't do. They take the road that is you know, not often <laughs> taken. Like quit your job twice and not knowing what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the day, now you have you know created something that is not only helping yourself, but helping a generation of people. I want to know if you have any last things to say to our M Lifestyle readers. What I would tell your viewers would be not to just do everything that the world tells you to do. All the business books, all the guru books are very like self-focused and self-centered. They're focused um, just on how you get your own success. But I think that's actually part of the problem because it's not just about your success and your happiness, but thinking more about your neighbor, thinking more about uh, something called generativity, which is the people after you. That might be your children, it just might be somebody else that you should be mentoring. And you will get where you need to go by helping other people get where they need to go. And I'm also looking for a lot of uh, stories as well as I continue to write this book. So you could uh, check that out at drewlichtenberger.com. Put your story in, I'd love to hear from you, quite frankly, because I want to know more about what's going on out there. Like I can say a lot of things, but I really need to understand more about uh, what's going on in your life. This is Pascaline with M Lifestyle. We just interviewed Drew Lichtenberger. To learn more about Drew and prepare a future, you can read his story on www.mlifestyle.us. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore mlifestyle. You can also like us on Facebook at mlifestyle. Have a great day.